Well, good morning. If y'all don't know me, my name is uh, Eric. I'm one of the pastors here. And um, if you're new here, visiting for the first time, we want to say welcome. We're delighted that you're here. We're so happy that you chose to worship with us this morning. Um, if you, I'm getting an echo. Is it, are y'all good? Okay. Are right, y'all good? I'm getting, I'm hearing like a lot of vibration, but it's, it's good. Uh, yeah, so if you don't know who we are, uh, we would love to meet you. So right out these double doors, there is a black table with some connect cards. Please fill that connect card out. We would love as pastors to kind of share who we are, why we planted this church here. And so, uh, yeah, do that for us. And um, yeah, so I've been going through the, the book of 1 Peter. Uh, and so you can go ahead and start uh, making your way there. And we're actually in chapter 3. Chapter 3. And um, this passage is another difficult passage. Last week, we talked about slaves and masters last week. So if you didn't hear that message, uh, visit our app and, and check that message out. Uh, it will give really good context to, to where we are right now. Uh, today, we get to talk through uh, wives submit to your own husbands. So praise God, we are a church that are about expository preaching, taking uh, verse by verse, chapter by chapter, verse by verse, and I don't get to skip this one. Um, nobody warned me. Nobody gave me a heads up on this. Uh, but I'm here. I got to do it. Got to do it. Um, and through the study, I realized that this may be a little bit more difficult culturally than actually the slaves and masters. I, I felt like it was a clear... I thought it was pretty clear, the slaves and masters, that we had a different type of thing. But here, I was under the weight of, man, I'm going to have to look them in their eyes and proclaim what God, what God says, right? Um, man, the church has been criticized for how we have, have dealt with this passage, or, or, or women in general, in marriage. And, um, and some of the criticism is, I say some of it, a lot of it is worthy uh, 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 to be criticized. Uh, I am of the belief uh, that we must listen to our critics. We gotta listen to our critics. Um, the feminist movement or the uh, women's liberation movement, we need to listen to what they're saying. I, I didn't say, you know, do what they're saying. But listen, what are, what are some of the pains and hurts over the centuries that the church has caused? And let it purify the church. Uh, listen to the argument of the feminists. Uh, don't just cover your ears when they're talking. Listen to the pain and hurt of what the church has put them through and still are putting them through. Yes, a lot of it has no merit, uh, but some of it does. And yes, you're right. Some of it doesn't even apply to, to you know, maybe Pillar Church or, or other really good, strong churches that value women. Uh, but, but, but we must listen. Listen to women's liberation movement and hear their deep wound that our society has caused. I, I say it is important to listen to your critics because there is something they hear, something they see, something they feel from us uh, that is coming from the church that is hurting them and has hurt women over the centuries. Yes, some are intentionally misinterpreting what the church has said and twisting scripture and words to aid their agenda. That's happening. For sure that's happening. But there is a value in listening and understanding uh, where historically we have missed it. Uh, one of uh, the main reasons I have seen uh, to, to listen to those who do not believe, I believe they uh, don't carry a baggage as believers that we usually carry into a, a text like this. Uh, they don't carry the same baggage, the religious baggage that comes with our, 
how we phrase things and how we just feel little, little gaps in, uh, even though the scripture doesn't say it. We feel little gaps in over our years of being in the church and hearing things that are unbiblical. So some of them ha don't have this baggage, and so it's really good to listen to a non-believer, to, to hear what they're saying about the church. It's perspectives that were like, oh, I just assumed in that, in that particular instance. And when I look a little deeper, the scripture never says that about women. And so that is one of the reasons. And, and I would say that's, a, that's a, a, a thing that take that in all of life. Anytime you have an enemy, anytime you have a critic, listen. They don't, ha they don't have the baggage that you have. Um, as much as we should be listening to these criticisms, we should not allow them to interpret scripture, scripture for us. Let Pastor Canaan do that, right? Don't let a, a, a non-believer interpret what the Bible says to you and, and believe that, that, that that's gold, what they're saying. Um, they, they, they did that with the slaves and, and, uh, the, uh, and master's passage. They, they, try to, they try to interpret that for us, an unbeliever, an ungodly person try to interpret that for us, and we're like, no, that's not what that means. So listen to the criticism, but don't let them uh, be your teacher. Um, the, the other possible thing we have done is allow un, an ungodly society, right? Uh, and... Um, the other possible thing we, we have done is allow ungodly society values to trump God's plan and role for men and women in marriage. So what I mean by that is that we've taken uh, these passages and, and dismissed them so much because they, they cause oppression when we see submission. <clears throat> we have, we've dismissed them and we said, oh, I'll take society values about who, who, who I should be in a marriage as a woman. Or, or how I should view my wife. We begin to dismiss the scriptures completely. So we're on both sides, right? Uh, we, we see both sides. Um, so on, on one side, we have allowed selfish motivations of our religious history to define how we talk about women, right? And, and their role in the marriage. On the other side, we have allowed those who have no fear of God to define where a woman should find her instruction for life in marriage. So we, we probably have two, both sides on there. Um, the entire First Peter study, we have noticed how vastly different the family structure is. We saw in the last message at the end of the chapter, too, that slavery was something very different than how we think of it today because of the brutal abuse of black people during the slave trade and repercussions of the devaluing of a black person in American history. There are significant cultural differences, but the instruction for men and women in marriage are the same today. Same instruction. The last message was about enduring your, uh, your cruel boss because this is what we're called to do. Peter's encouragement to, to endure this type of treatment was to entrust themselves to God. They were not holding out hope that the master would all of a sudden become a good master, but they entrusted themselves to God. And so my, my call today to, to women who are listening uh, this morning, and whether you're single or married, is that the call for Peter is not to entrust yourself to a, to a husband, but to entrust yourself to God and be obedient in submission. The call, just like with the, the, with the slave or the, or the employer, was supposed to not entrust himself that the boss would get better, but entrust himself that God had him here and would protect him and guide him during this. And so we see the same thing. So today we're looking at pastors that ask women to entrust her, herself because... Um, a husband, but once again to entrust herself to God. Why? Because it is precious, verse 4 says. Look at chapter 3, verse 4. He said, it is precious. Maybe some of your um, says it is pleasing in your sight, in his sight. Last week, entrusting ourselves to God rather than our boss brought favor, 
Remember that one? It actually brought favor, and it is what we're called to do. Those were two key points I felt like as we had submitted ourselves to a cruel boss, two things that would happen as blessings. We would get favor, right? We, we would, and then we would entrust ourselves to, to a God that would come through, would not let us uh, be put to shame. Um, this is going to be fun. This is going to be fun. Uh, as I was preparing this week, um, I think I came home. I, I told Linda, my wife, that I would be preaching this passage, and I came home uh, maybe after training or something. And I was a little tired, but I, I walked in the kitchen, I said hello, and um, I kind of slapped her on the backside and I said, uh, submit. <laughs> I just wanted to see what would happen. No response. <laughs> Slapped her on the backside again. I said, submit. And this time she did respond. <laughs> the godly woman that she was, she reaches around, slaps me on the chest, and said, get rich. <laughs> so we, we're not there yet. I'm about to preach a passage that we are working on. We are working on this in our home. So I'm glad you laughed there because, guys, this is a really tough thing to even, even when you see it so clear in the scriptures. I'm making jokes about it, but um, that's, that is exactly how we have kind of misinterpreted this scripture. Submit. Submit. Right? Let's pray. God, I need you. I need you now. There's a lot to cover. And I just pray that by your spirit, you would allow us to hear what it is that you have for us in this text, both men and women, both single and married, both children and young adults, both old and young. God, what is it that you want us to see in this passage that would cause us to know you more and glorify you more? Help me, teach me, in Jesus' name, amen. First Peter 3, 1 through 6. In the same way, in the same way of what? In the same way where we saw um, slaves obeying their, or, or submitting to their masters. In the same way, wives, submit yourself to your own husbands so that, even if some disobey the word, they may be won over without a word by the way of their wives, uh, the, the way their wives live. When they observe your pure, reverent lives, verse 3, don't let your beauty consist of outward things like elaborate hairstyles and wearing gold jewelry, but rather what is inside the heart, the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. For in the past, the holy women who put their hope in God also adorned themselves in this way, submitting their, to their own husbands. Just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, you have become her children when you do what is good and do not fear intimidation. The, defining submission. Let's just try to define it here it could have been defined as, you know, uh, to obey, to be subject. Uh, a, Greek, the, a Greek military term meaning to arrange um, uh, in a military fashion under a, a, a leader. Or, if it's non-military, it, in a non-military use, it was a voluntary attitude of giving in. And here's a word that I'm about to say that I'm probably going to use a lot in this passage. Cooperating. Cooperating. Okay? I believe that that word really helps us picture what this looks like in a submission 
um, marriage, in, in a marriage where, where the husband is submitting himself to God and the wife is submitting herself unto her husband, cooperating. So I'll use that some. Cooperating, assuming responsibility, and, and carrying a burden. I think that's a good one too. Carrying a burden. For me, this word cooperate communicates God's heart in wives submitting to their husbands. It is, a, it is clear in Scripture that God values women and puts them in prominent roles in Scripture. Uh, we, we see them as prophetess. We, we see Sarah, Miriam, Deborah, Hannah, and we can go on, Esther. We, we see Phoebe as a deacon. We see Deborah as a judge, significant people, women in the Bible. So we see that their, 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 their strength and their ability, their wisdom is equal with a man. We, we don't see any unequalness that God shows us between a man and a woman. So why this submission? Paul spoke of uh, several women as partners and leaders in the church when he was writing his letters. Submitting to the husband has nothing to do with capability of the woman, but God is, has prescribed the role of the woman as one who submits to her own husband. In the same way, it says, the scripture says right there, it says, in the same way. This forces us to look back a little and see the context. Peter says, in the same way I discuss submitting to your masters with reverence, he uses the same idea, idea of falling under the authority or the willing falling under authority, not because of value, not because of value, but because of showing God's goodness and grace. It says, submit to your own husband. Sounds like cooperating. Sounds like cooperating with your husband rather than apart, doing things apart from, from him. Work with them and be an ally in what God has called you to as a, as a, as a couple, as a, as a body. Submit not to what he says, right? We think everything he says, I got to submit to. No, not to what he says, but to submit to his overall good. Submit to his overall good as a leader. I am so thankful that, that Linda didn't just lay down and listen to everything I said. We would be in deep trouble right now. My wife is Linda, sorry. Wives, please talk back to your husbands. I am urging you to talk back to your husbands. We, I would be in a lot of trouble if my wife didn't talk back to me. It didn't speak truth when I was speaking ignorance. But do it not to show dominance over him or higher intelligence, but talk back to them so that they can be a better leader. Cooperate with the greater plan for y'all's marriage to show God glorious. If you are talking back just to prove your worth, <laughs> then that's not submitting. If you are talking back because you care about him and his role as the head of the home, then he should feel your gentleness when you're talking back. He should feel your care when you're talking back. He should feel that you are for him and not just trying to be uncooperative. Anything else will feel like a flagrant rejection of him and his role as the head. If you, have a, um, if you have a husband that disobeys the word, um, uh, either they're not non-believer or they just in this season are not submitting to the word. He says to respect him and win him over without you saying anything, rather by, by the way you honor him, by the way you make him a better man by the way you create a life in him when you are in his presence. Your submission is not yes to everything. It is a spirit-filled response to what the husband needs to flourish as a man. You honor him by being a servant of God to see God's glory in your life. He sees and observes your life, and he sees and experiences a reverence that is beyond what is common. 
He sees a wife that respects him and values him and honors him, not for who he is, but what God wants him to become. In submission, the wife is dependent on God to give her eyes to see beyond what her husband is to what God created him to be. A spirit filled no is better than a lack of faith, yes. See, a woman who submit is not after her own good, but the good of the kingdom. She's not self-serving, but allows her husband to lead and use her gifts, her strength, her intelligence to help him flourish as a leader. This life does not come from you trying to please wives, singles who are preparing to be married. This life does not come from you trying to please your husband. This is not how it happens. This life comes from you seeking to please God. You entrusting yourself to God. A wife that submits because their husband deserves it will get a husband's reward. Again, if you are submitting because your husband deserves it, you will get a husband's reward from it. But if you submit because of your dependence and your desire to please God, you will get a God-like reward. I quote this, I feel like every sermon, Hebrews eleven six. 6. Now, without faith, it is impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. If you are seeking for him to do what he's supposed to do in your marriage, and that is the reason you're submitting, you will get his reward if you seek God to honor him, to glorify God, first and foremost, you will get a God reward. Wives, submit, corporate. Cooperate with your husband. Be an ally. Cooperate in such a way that he feels better and feels confident in your presence. Submission has less to do who is calling the shots and more to do with the woman playing the supportive role for the husband to flourish rather than to be hindered. The goal is to, to bring glory to God in the marriage and show the beauty of the gospel in it. The goal is not to find out who is the better leader or the better decision maker. There are very few decisions I make without consulting my wife, very few. I would be a fool as a leader not to go to someone who is smarter than me at times. I would be a fool. I would be a, I would be a foolish leader. I am still the leader, and I found the best answer. So I'm a pretty good leader. If I found the best answer, it was in my wife, I found it. You ever meet somebody, and they're like a millionaire, or they run a huge church or a big business, and you, and you spend about an hour with them, and you're like, how did this guy do this. I know that sounds bad, but listen, he found the right people to run his business. He found the way. He asked enough questions. He got enough support for his business to run it successfully. He's a leader still. He may not be the sharpest tool. He may not be the smartest, but he is the leader of that corporation, that million dollar corporation. He found the people, he found the answers. That's leadership. Not, not the man having to make the final, I mean, make the, the decision and it had to come from him. Only God speaks through him. That's not what we do. As a, as a couple, as a, a, as a family. Submit yourselves to your own own husbands, it says, so that even if some disobey the word, submitting to your husband looks like it is not a matter of if he is living by God's word. This is pretty um, consistent with God. He, he didn't say, hey, wait for your boss to get it right. He didn't say, hey, wait for us to find a, a godly president, then start to obey the authority. 
This is pretty consistent with God. He didn't say, hey, when the boss gets it right, then you can start respecting and honoring him. Now he gets to the husband and he's consistent. It's not waiting on the husband to be the loving, sacrificial person that she wants him to be. He says, he says this, is, this is so hard for us today to wrap our minds around this because the world has to twist it, our thinking. And this is the key point, I, I believe, in this. Because even saying that, I'm like, wow. The world is teaching us that life is meant for you and to gratify you. That's what the world teaches. It bombards us. Our friends bombard us with it. The commercials bombard us with it. Life in general bombards us with it. I don't care how much we come to church. We're bombarded by this idea that life is meant for my gratification. And so when we hear scripture like this, we're like, that doesn't sound right, or we ignore it. How about this? Well, let me read this. This is, um, take care of number one. You are what matters most. And to find happiness, you may have to hurt other people at times, but it's what you have to do. It's a doggy dog world, right? The problem, what, what that says is very unbiblical. Matthew 10, 39 says, whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. Now that's, that's biblical. Philippians 2, 4, do nothing out of selfish ambition or empty pride, but in humility consider others more important than yourselves. Each of you should not look only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Jesus is our example. Remember that, guys. I know as believers, we forget that sometimes. It was silly bracelets that we were, we were, we were wearing, but they had a lot of truth to them. What would Jesus do? Jesus is our example. He gave his life. Ladies, the world messages comes strong and consistent, and it claims it, it knows the way to happiness. It says, it says, take care of number one. Takes care of number one, obedience. Here's the truth, obedience to the word is the only hope for true joy and happiness. And I'll always preach that from here. I will always preach that. I will never tell you, hey, if you get married, then you will be happy. If you get divorced, then you will be happy. If you get this job, I will never preach that. I will always say obedience to the word is the only hope for true joy and happiness. Pastor Canaan will only preach that type of message. It's not coming. True joy, true fulfillment will come from no other place. 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4, look at it. Don't let your beauty consist of outward things like elaborate hairstyles and wearing gold jewelry, but rather what is inside the heart, the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. That's good. Peter commands women to be beautiful. He says, be beautiful. Be as beautiful as you possibly can. Spend your whole life becoming as beautiful as you can. Every day, spend energies trying to be beautiful. It sounds so much like I'm encouraging women to spend more time at the shopping mall or more time in the gym getting fit. Or it sounds like I'm asking women to spend more time in their closet figuring out their outfit or more time in the mirror putting on makeup. It sounds like that because we are so accustomed to defining beauty by the world's standard and by the world's idea of beauty. As exiles and strangers here on this earth, God tells us beauty is in the heart of a woman. It is the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit. This is not a quiet woman. <laughs> Listen. This is not a quiet woman. Her spirit is quiet or it's meek. Use that word. 
or as meek. Her spirit is such that she knows when to talk and when she knows when to be silent. She has no lack of knowledge, no lack of knowledge or no lack of understanding. She just knows when to use it because she is walking in the spirit of God. She is submissive first of all. She is first submissive to the spirit of God and allows her to work alongside her husband that wins her husband over because of her quiet spirit, her meek spirit. Her spirit is not quiet like you, you can't hear it. It is quiet like controlled and calculated. She is a powerful woman that is capable of everything her husband is capable of, but calculates to ensure her husband feels respected and honored with her power. How you, have you ever seen uh, the power and the beauty of a tiger with stripes? Have you seen how they walked and they were just like muscular? And they were, they were somewhat gentle, but you knew if you messed with them, you would be dead soon. They're beautiful. And then all of a sudden, the same tiger with these Big claws of teeth would gently grab her baby by the mouth and carry it to where she needed it to go. That's the picture of a submissive, godly woman who knows her beauty, knows her power, who knows her strength, but her spirit is quiet. She's just not pouncing on every situation that she can prove her husband wrong, but she's submissive, understanding that I'm here to guard him, to hold him, to point him to Jesus. I'm here to love him and care for him in such a way that he would know that he's respected and that he is okay to lead in this home. Even if he's not leading, he has room to lead in this home. I am going to make it as easy as possible for him to lead, even if he doesn't. A gentle and quiet spirit is heard loud and clear. Whether she says a word or not, her presence demands attention because her beauty comes from God. Her beauty is not man made, but God made. It is made in a daily dependence on the spirit of God to honor and submit to our husband as God would have her to submit and honor him. She is being led daily in the word of God. She has this open on a daily basis. Because she wants to be first led by God's spirit, meditating on it day and night to be found knowing him more and more and more. Again, the woman is not honoring him because he deserves it, but because she believes in God. Believe in God. We ask people, believe in God, right? Christians believe in God so much that you're not entrusting yourself to an evil master or a, a man that is not um, holding firm to God's word, but you're entrusting yourself to God. You're believing God in your submission. She believes God is better than any other man-made plan to find fulfillment. She believes that God created and ordered things currently. And she believes that God instruction for her being submissive is better than any instruction for her life that doesn't line up with God. I say that because Christ's submission to the Father was not dependent on the church's faithfulness. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine if Christ waited on us to get right before he would submit to God and his instructions to go to the cross? Can you imagine that it was a waiting on us? We would be still left in our sins. It was Christ while we were yet sinners. He died for us. It was Christ that took the initiative. It was Christ that that gave his life. 
So you want to say what the submission looks like. Let's look at Jesus. Jesus wasn't lower than us, but he submitted his life for us. Hmm. Hebrews 12.2 says, Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Ladies, wives, you're pursuing joy when you submit. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. When you are seeking to be obedient to God in marriage, your desire is for his reward. You want him to bless you. You're not asking for your husband to bless you. You're asking for God to bless you in those moments. It says, which is very precious in the sight of God. This is important in how we look at this passage on beauty and submission. We see this type of conclusion on other instructions. This is precious. After this particular instruction, he says, which is very precious in the sight of God. Basically, this is a particular thing that God smiles at when you're gentle and quiet. He smiles at this. Jesus died for you, and now you are the righteousness of God. But... If you want to walk in obedience and no joy of living for him, then let your beauty that comes from being a gentle woman with a meek spirit control you. Be controlled by the spirit. When you seek to be beautiful like this for God, you begin to experience his favor. You get to see this same type of conclusion in verses 2, 220. We, we, we saw this same type of conclusion he had. Oh, I have it here. 220 says, for what credit is there if when you do wrong and are beaten, you endure it? But when you do what is good and suffer, if you endure it, this brings favor with God. The conclusion always is a pleasing of God because that's what we've been called to. Not our own happiness, not our own joy, not our own satisfaction, but to give our life away. First Peter 2, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Women, this is clear instruction of what God wants us to do. Singles, this is clear instruction of what God has called you to be in marriage. What type of woman he is preparing you to be for his glory. Submission is not you being your husband's servant. It is not you losing your voice. It is not you being quiet and agreeing to everything he decides and says. No, it is you Rather than using your power and intelligence and giftedness for your own glory, it is used in the context of a marriage for the glory of God. Specifically, God said you can use these things to, to cooperate with your husband, to submit to him. Calling to reflect the beauty of the gospel in the marriage, in the family. 1 Peter 3, 3 and 4 says, don't let your beauty consist of outward things like elaborate hairstyles and wearing of gold jewelry, but rather what is inside the heart, the imperishable quality and gentle and quiet spirit, which is of great worth in God's sight. This may be obvious, but I want to say it. I think it may be helpful for me to say that this is not a prohibition against nice clothing, nice hairstyles and jewelry. Rather, this is a recalibrating of the Christian to make sure more time and energy is spent on the heart than the outward appearance. This only may be obvious. This also may be obvious, but I think it, it may need to be said also. Christians need to do everything they can to dress proper in proper occasions. <laughs> the instruction for Peter is not to care about how you dress, not to not care about how you dress, the instruction is for you to not make it uh, that you're your attempt at beauty. That's not where you're going to get beauty from. I would encourage you to dress to impress as a Christian. I would encourage you to not be as weird as, as we already are believing in a virgin birth. 
already as weird as we are believing that a man rose from the day, a dead to save us. To top it off and for us not to be in this world where we can associate this world because we're so weird, we can't even dress right. This is not Peter's instruction. Go shop. Get your hair done. Please. I didn't mean it like that, guys. They adorn themselves by being submissive to their husbands. 1 Peter 3, 5, and 6. For in the past, the holy women who put their hope in God also adorned themselves in this way, submitting to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. You have become her children when you do what is good and do not fear any intimidation. Their cooperation with their husband, Sarah's cooperation with her husband made, made her beautiful, made them beautiful. Their submissiveness was so balanced and good that Sarah made Abraham a better leader. She lifted him with her respect towards him. Her words were careful and calculated. She made him a better man. And what is this calling? What is this calling him Lord? That's weird because of our culture today. This is a difficult translation for scholars, but the idea is simply Sarah using a title of respect and honor. The Message Bible uh, captures the idea by saying, my dear husband. That better? Instead of Lord, my dear husband. It's just a, a, an expression of respect and honor. Being submissive is not outdated. It's not an outdated command of God. This direction that Peter gives to the people holds beauty and value for our marriage today in 2022. I know our culture wants to promote self-fulfillment over obedience and happiness over holiness, as if holiness does not bring us true and lasting happiness in the Lord. Our world wants us to believe that our commands from God are old-fashioned and outdated, but they're not. The prince of this world, Satan, hates marriage, and he will attack a woman with lies to destroy her marriage. You see, the marriage is a beautiful picture of the gospel. It is the reflection of Christ and her bride to the church. It is the most clear picture that we have in life of submission and sacrificial love we have. And if Satan can attack the woman through unbiblical modern principles, he will, and he has. Satan hates to remind to be reminded that he has been defeated. And what a biblical marriage does, it repeats the gospel's message over and over to Satan, that Satan has been defeated through the perfect will of the Father. The reason God created marriage is to model the love of Christ for the church and the response of the church through submission. Ladies, don't let Satan rob you of your blessing. By calling you to uh, calling your your obedience to God old fashioned. Ladies, do not lose yourself when you obey God's commands. You actually find freedom in God's ordained structure. Satan tries to make us believe that playing different roles are somehow unfair and unequal. They're just different roles. The wide receiver in the huddle doesn't say, Tom Brady, you're getting all the attention. I, let me throw to you this time. There's two different, those roles cannot be mingled. The father, this is the clearest picture. Jesus, equal with the father, submits himself. Philippians 2, 5, and 6 says, I adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited. He submitted himself. He's equal with God, but they have different roles, not different values, different functions, different roles. Every woman is equal to her husband in her being, uh, in her being, not equal in her role or function. A wife is a joint heir, we'll see in verse 7, an equal partner without the same role or function. 
Ephesians 5, 22 and 23 says, Why submit to your husbands as to the Lord, because the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church. He is the savior of the body. 24 says, Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to your husbands in everything. This is not saying wives obey a man, uh, er everything a man says, like a servant. This is saying submit to him as he, his strength, as his strength to carry out God's will. Be his strength at times. Submit to him as his equal partner. Play the role of a wife in cooperating to achieve the goal of marriage, and that is to reflect his glory. Here's my disclaimers from this message. Don't lie for him. I'm not saying to lie for him. I know we want to uplift him and we want to keep him uh, strong, but I'm not saying to lie for him. Don't make excuses for him. Don't ignore his faults. If he's cheap, call him cheap. Don't make up stuff. That is not submitting, that is lying. If he is physically abusive, get someone involved quickly. That's not submitting to be quiet. You're not cooperating when you're being silent when you need to speak up. Women are not supporting him as a doormat to wipe his feet, but his supporting cast member to make his performance great. First Corinthians, and here's the scripture for that. 1 Corinthians 11, 7 says, A man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and the glory of God. The rest of that scripture says, The man, the man in his headship glorifies God, but women is the glory of man. You are one with him and hold the role that carries wisdom, strength, and support that he needs to thrive as a leader. Let's pray. Dear God, um, thank you for your word. Thank you for, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that he didn't wait for me to get it right because I would have never got it right. I pray that when we view marriage, we, we see the gospel we see the love and grace and mercy that has been shown to us through Jesus Christ. I pray that that truth would overwhelm us as we consider as husbands to love and to protect and to sacrifice our life for our wives. And then as wives, I pray that we would not be so manipulated. We would not be manipulated by our current culture who, who says this is, this is old-fashioned to be submissive. It's old-fashioned to, to be respectful. God, I pray that we would value this amazing truth, a pursuit for joy for our wives, for our singles, for those who are listening, a pursuit for joy and to know you more in obedience to you in marriage, God. God, help us. Thank you in Jesus' name.